Hello and welcome to Looking Up. This is a podcast for Christian women. I am Kathy Pollard and with me is your other host, Carla Moore. And we want to thank you for joining us. We're so thankful for those of you who are watching, those of you who are listening. It means a lot to us and we hope that we'll have good conversation together and to remind all of us to keep looking up and know that no matter what's going on in the world, everything's going to be okay for those who are following Christ. Uh, We have an extra special episode for today because we have special guests joining us today. We have Neil Pollard and John Moore, and we've all been cruising and visiting Bible lands together, and we're going to have good conversation about all kinds of things. We have not told them ahead of time what we're going to ask them or what we're going to talk about, so I know it's going to be very interesting, but we thank you guys. Yeah. (laughs) We thank you guys for joining us and for being willing to do this. And we've talked about this for a while, Mm -hmm. actually, the idea of doing one together. So I'm glad that this worked out so that we could do it. So a captive audience. A captive audience. They can't get away from us. Yeah. (laughs) You are in the hot seat. Are you ready? Probably not. Probably not. All right, Carla, you've actually come up with some ideas of things we'll talk about with them, but before we get into that, we thought we would update you a little bit. We've talked about the cruise in the past couple of episodes, so we won't take too long with that, but um, update you a little bit on what we've been doing the past couple of days since the last time we recorded. What are you, you guys, what are your impressions about our trip and what we've been doing? Well, I, I, I want to say this because I know that John and Carla won't, but they. Uh, Herbus. This has been, well, it's it's been so smooth and uh, everything that you would want out of a trip, but wouldn't anticipate, were things that were taken care of, and mm-hmm. I just think it's so impressive that uh, this is a, a ministry. You know, it's not something you do for profit, but you do it so well, mm-hmm. and I just. We, we've been at the back of the line, so we get to hear the buzz from people behind, and they've been so pleased, and I think that they have enjoyed every stop, even though we had some unexpected changes at the last minute. Thank, Thank you. you. We're sweet. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that has uh, been one of the most, I guess, um, exciting things about this trip, is that given all the obstacles like you were talking about, to see how God has blessed us uh, in that about the relationships in the end. Got to see a lot of neat things, but to see how God worked among everyone. And uh, of course, we shouldn't be surprised whenever Christians get together. You know, there's going to be a lot of joy and, and just uh, the way that people helped each other out. And, uh, and then mm-hmm. naturally, we learned a lot of things along the way that fortified our faith. Mm-hmm. So we recorded on Saturday, right? And that was the day we were on Crete. And so y'all went out. What did you do that day? You did something. <laughs> yeah. You rented a or something? Well, we started so off, by, yeah, we, we, uh, we got on the shuttle, headed over to the museum, and uh, which none of us had been, I'd been to a museum years ago there, and this was a new one, so we figured out how to get there, 27 minute walk once we got off the shuttle, and then we did a little detour to... Well, I got to walk in the Mediterranean. You did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I heard you did a little more than walking in the Mediterranean. Well, yeah. well, I, was I, I should have taken off my shoes first. Well, but, uh, anybody, waiting, uh, I'm a little waiting, huh? That's what happens when you explore, right? That's right. Little things like that's that right. happen. I picked up rocks that I had to give back to the people at uh, yeah. Royal when I got yeah. home. Yeah. But, yeah, we, we just walked. It's a, it a great museum. I think they were able to do a whole lot more in this expanded location. It, they just moved months or just a little over a year ago. Yeah, about a year, I think, yeah. Uh-huh. But, but about the Mino and Mycenaean civilization and kind of the you know, the early inhabitants of that island as the forerunners to the Greek civilization. So uh, that was interesting. And so while we're there, this is what was so funny is that Neil read something uh, on one of the little, you know, uh, at the museum. At the, at the museum, was one of the exhibits, and he comes up and goes, have you ever heard of this place? I said, no. And he goes, well, you tell them what you saw. Well, it was Aptera, and it's the there were still ruins, and uh, so I don't know. We just thought, well, you know, it'd be neat to go over there, and so John said, well, see if you can find a way for us to get over there. And so there's a real, real helpful guy at the front desk. We wore him out, <laughs> and uh, he uh, called a taxi service, and found out. In fact, we got a minibus to come, and there were it wound up being ten, ten of us. Yeah, I think so. And uh, to rent this minibus for two hours was 140 euros, which I'm thinking, 
wow, he's going to stay with us mm -hmm. internally. Be pretty helpful and told yeah. us about different things. But I'm sitting in, up there in the front thinking maybe this is 140 euros per person. person. <laughs> Yikes. And so I'm praying all along the way, Lord, please let me not have just made a nightmare of <laughs> this. But he was the nicest guy, yeah. uh, Panos, or I can't remember now what his name was. But uh, we talked the whole time. Went out there, and it was a, uh, I guess some of the ruins were fourth century BC. There was a gate, and then most of it was Roman era. Mm -hmm. There were baths, and John found the underground cisterns. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw the top of it. I had no idea. And of course, he, you know, went down in the hole. Uh -huh. <laughs> of course. But did you get a picture of that? Uh, I didn't. From the oh, back side. We were over yeah. here, and he was over there finding holes to climb. You need in. one to add to and, Carla's collection. Yeah. Well, we're sitting in the uh, bus coming back. He's going, did y'all see these pictures? There's like three rows, and we're like, we, you know, we had no idea it was there. We went, there was a little Odeon uh, theater. And we, we sang in there. It was, it was a neat little... So the long story short is that John and Neil have taken up a new profession and they are now tour directors with Royal Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to remember back in time before yeah. they closed the doors. Yeah. So. Well, it was an adventure, and that was the, you know, kind of yeah, well, off-the-cuff kind mm -hmm. of thing that was happening. Yeah. That made it mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. yeah. And we stayed on the ship that day and recorded mm -hmm. and, and had a nice... It was calm. Nice, calm day. Mm -hmm. Hardly anybody was on the ship, so we enjoyed that. So that was... Saturday and then Sunday we worshiped together on the ship and we had some visitors that uh, joined us and mm -hmm. that was a good day. What the uh, Hiram yeah, preached well, a fa fantastic lesson. Yeah, mm -hmm. first we invited some people that had actually been um, had stopped by. They'd been, you know, we've been singing every night out on the deck of the ship and uh, near a walking track area where a few people go. It's a quiet place on the ship and people have been coming by and those that would stop we didn't invite them. but. The, the four people that came were those who were just sitting next to us in the dining room, remember? And mm -hmm. so as we're inviting the waiter to come and, and uh, mm -hmm. to worship with us the next day, this guy gets up and he goes, I couldn't help but overhear you guys talking. I, you know, we'd like, would it be okay if we joined y'all tomorrow? Mm -hmm. We said, sure. And so next he was a done. missionary in Istanbul, Turkey for six years. Okay, and I didn't know the that. The religious yeah. group he was a part of. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other two that just we thought had come from the night before, they were just walking down the hallway uh, during our worship service, you know, uh, as a part of where all the, the cabins are, and they heard us, and they decided just to come in, and, uh, mm -hmm. and that was how they... I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was Sunday morning. It was a, a great worship service, all this. We haven't had anybody really be sick. You know, I've been mm -hmm. so thankful for that. And, mm -hmm. uh, minor stuff. Yeah, minor things, but, uh, you know, you hear about cruise ships and stomach issues, and I just haven't heard much of that. So thankfully, uh, but that afternoon, we went into, is it Bodrum or Bodrum? Bodrum, Bo I think, right? Bodrum, I think, yeah. Turkey, <laughs> that place in Turkey. And what was, <laughs> what was the uh, celebration going on with the Jets? It's their 100 year. 100 year of um, autonomy, of being yeah. a nation, being yeah. a nation. the current nation mm -hmm. of Turkey. Well, they made an announcement on the, uh, on the ship's intercom that morning, but I didn't hear it. But Pam Randall made sure that we knew. <laughs> she said that if you hear jets at 2 p.m., that's why it's a celebration. And sure enough, I mean, I'm so glad that she said that because we would have been oh, a little nervous. Low and loud. Yeah. Even yeah. yeah. knowing it the first time it yeah. flew over, it yeah. started. So it'll start yeah. on. Yeah, I got a little bit of video. Did y'all get any video of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we might have to share that next week. And so that day, John and I and Brian and Shannon, we rented a kind of a small boat that took us out into the uh, wherever we, I mean, the, the but, day, yeah. but is that the Aegean or where, where, where we are, the Aegean, Mediterranean, yeah, there, Aegean? Right close to where it starts. So they took us out to a couple of spots and, and we got to see gorgeous water and uh, long story short on that, as we were coming back into the harbor, this little boat tootled up and it was selling ice cream. It <laughs> just pulled up next to it us. It was an ice cream truck, it was an ice cream, ice cream boat. boat. The yeah. only thing that was missing was the little songs that they play, you know, yeah. the, from childhood. <laughs> we didn't hear any of that, but it yeah. just made John's whole day. Delivery yeah. ice cream, that was yeah. the best thing. Ice cream was brought to you. Uh-huh, <laughs> yeah, but that was fun. It was a fun day, and y'all And you got to get in the water, John, which, right, wasn't that, that was trip also? Mystery. You've been uh, wanting uh, to. We're hoping to leave that out. Just, uh, <laughs> oh. Oh. You took your shoes off first. Oh, well, I did, and uh, but I think that you know the fish all were scared away because we saw that. <laughs> okay, moving right along. <laughs> Next, we, we have had the, we had the balloon in the group with yeah. us, and we 
we walked over to the archaeological underwater archaeolo archaeological museum. Mm -hmm. That was neat. That was very neat. There was a, mm -hmm. a Byzantine era mm -hmm. ship that was um, discovered and had several tons of uh, weight. I was talking to Dean Murphy at some point. I can't remember the exact number, but they they have extracted five tons of material, mm -hmm. uh, most of it glass, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of several intact jars and so forth. So it was, it was neat to see, um, as we think about Acts 27 and the shipwreck that happened there, you know, think about all the cargo that was thrown overboard. Yeah. Maybe at some point mm -hmm. they'll pull that out, you know, but, yeah. but to see things like that was, was neat. Mm -hmm. Instructional pleasure. You know, no. <laughs> no. I'm sure we had some carnal, of spiritual. <laughs> yeah, the truth comes out. No, there's yeah. a, many other details. That we yeah. Well, and I, I think we did mention last week that we there's several days that are on our own. You know, we don't mm -hmm. have planned excursions, and that was one of the days that everyone could choose what they wanted to do. And, and so most people just headed into the town and yeah. did some. Well, and that was added to the list, remember, because we were right. initially right. supposed to go there. To go to Israel we were supposed days. to be in Nazareth on Sunday, yeah. yeah, and worship with the brethren there and take a boat, but we will not talk about that again, huh? Yeah. So Monday, then we went into Rhodes, which is Greece, and can you all talk a little bit about what we saw there? Well, I mean, from a biblical standpoint, it is referenced um, in, a, in the Old Testament, at least we can kind of patch some things together to that regard, but... Uh, Acts 21.1, I think. It's just mentioned as a stop-off. We have no idea how long Paul was there, and he continues on his, uh, his journey. Um, but it was certainly, um, that would have been the return from the third missionary journey. So it, it's, it's in the Bible, but, but we didn't really, um, nowhere really for us to go and to see that part. You can speak to the other well, yeah, uh, tradition says that you know he spent some time there preaching the gospel, and there is a presence of a couple of Byzantine churches and all that, but definitely a Roman site, and so it just kind of gave us a feel of maybe again what Paul and other early Christians would have encountered when they went there to places like that, the, the paganism, the the world of Rome, and the emperor worship, and but that whole Acropolis up there, oh, you know, dedicated incredible. to uh, uh, Athena. Believe it or not, uh, there was a temple up there to her and to Apollos, uh, Apollo, and um, yeah. Just so very was, grand. I yeah, didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. and it supposedly and the looked, view. Yeah, the view. Yeah, yeah no, lo overlooking uh, what they call St. Paul's Bay. But we don't know if he landed there at Lindos or if he landed at, you know, at uh, Rhodes uh, itself, the city. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that was Monday. And then on Tuesday, we were, that was yesterday, we were in Cyprus. That was yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. It was. Wow, days are running together. And what I kept thinking, and we talked about this, was how much it looked like Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it smelled like Israel, looked like Israel. The terrain was so much like Israel. But what y'all talk about what we saw while we were there? Well, I mean, that was one of the places that um, Paul stopped at on his first missionary tour. And Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, Acts chapters 13 and 14. And um, we got to actually go to... Uh, Papos and uh, Papas, I think, as some say, and heard a great lesson. Mm. Neil yeah. spoke at the little Odeon there. It was a second century AD Odeon, but still gave you a, a sense of the idea of that area being a Roman, you know, place, Roman city, and and uh, just really was nice to think about uh, again these early missionary tours that occurred in these areas. But the thing that was most exciting, I think, you need to convey and tell about. Well, um, so far as we know, and it's kind of hard sometimes to know what all the facts are, but uh, there have not been New Testament Christians on the island of Cyprus for some time. And there was a young man from Uganda who's studying at Eastern Mediterranean College who has been searching for truth for um, what had been for about a year and a half and reached out to Churches of Christ and a variety of brotherhood um, organizations, including World Video Bible School, uh, played a part in getting uh, Rod Selman and Victoria, his wife, over to essentially, they'd had some communication to baptize him, did a follow-up um, uh, study with him and then a, a friend or roommate of, his name is Kith uh, Nimbali, uh, and so there's a Christian that we know of that's been baptized and he's so thrilled and uh, he's growing he, he worships um, online 
with the Lehman Avenue congregation. Um, and uh, we just found out before this trip that Wayne Parker, who's been a missionary for a long time in the South Pacific, that uh, they're going over to Cyprus um, to begin work. So hopefully further establish the church on the island of Cyprus. Was that in the works before they found out about Kith, or was that after? You know, I need to ask him. I've been corresponding with him about another new convert that's in the Bowling Green area. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if um, this motivated him because yeah. it's gotten the attention of a lot of folks um, in the Brotherhood with, uh, and especially him being in, uh, if I'm saying it right, Fumagusta, mm. um, which is kind of on the north end, north of the UN buffer zone on the Turkish side, uh, which I think the relations are fairly friendly between those two. Um, but I'm not sure. Salamis, biblical Salamis is just south of where the, the college is. And I think that's where Wayne is going. Mm -hmm. Well, that was where uh, Neil's lesson about the power of one and influence and Barnabas being there and his work and coming from that island and then just thinking about um, what all they were able to do just as a few small uh, you know band of Christians and then uh, kind of the connection in between what just a few people who were online you know watching you know here's this gentleman watching the work that uh, brethren have put up and all the efforts of just one person here and there but yeah ultimately then as you said pointing us to the power of one, how did you say the power of one that leads us to, how do you remember? And then pointing us to <laughs> the one is at the end. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think it was neat. You made a point on the bus out there about how you know, Barnabas and Paul go to Cyprus and they evangelize there, but there's the Acts 11 connection where you have um, some come into Cyprus teaching the Jews only, but you have some Christians coming from Cyprus, so the church has already been there, going to Antioch area. And they're also teaching to the Greeks. And, and that's been a neat thing about all of this. We're going back to the Bible lands where the where the church began in the thousands. You know, as Luke gives us that yeah, chronicling going through. And it's it's really heartbreaking and on one level to see how sparse the church is throughout this region. Um, and now we have the opportunity to go back and take the gospel mm -hmm. where the gospel first went out from, mm -hmm. you know, so you think about Nazareth and some other places, and we sure need the church uh, to, to go back to these places. If this sounds familiar to some listening in today, it's because we talked about this on the podcast. Do you remember, Carla, back in the spring yeah, when we first heard about Kith and his mm -hmm. story, and we shared it, and um, I believe even shared an address for him because some of the ladies were wanting to know how they could reach him and mm -hmm. send cards of encouragement. So yeah. this is the same gentleman that we're talking about when we visited Cyprus. That's where he's at. Right? We were really mm -hmm. hoping we could link up with him, but I mm -hmm. didn't realize it's a bigger island and it would have taken, what, two or three hours to, to well, get over there. And it was the other direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and I, it's a little bit hard. You have to take your passport, and it's more involved. I don't know how mm -hmm. hard it would be to come back to the Greek side once you've gone up there. Yeah. On our, and we had a very short days, you remember, mm -hmm. in Cyprus. Yesterday. I had no idea that there was there was Turkish mm -hmm. Cyprus and Greek Cyprus. So that was something I learned yesterday, among other things. Yeah, I asked Neil when we were first talking about it, because visiting the Greek islands has been on my bucket list for a long time. And I said, and now we're hitting how many? And I started naming them off, and he said, well, <laughs> Cyprus, you can't really say right, is a Greek island because it doesn't belong to either one, really. Not solely so, Greek. So mm -hmm. is it a sovereign nation, I think, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, well, that's what I understand. I mean, there's a lot of controversy and still debate about it, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they, you know, Greek and Turkish, so. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. did Turkish islands and Greek islands. <laughs> Two for one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, it's been good, and, mm -hmm. and I, I really wish we could have done what we originally had planned on doing, and we'll just have to do it again. Mm -hmm. And what the latest that's going on in Israel is, I think, maybe speak to that just a little bit, and then we have more stuff that we want yeah, to get to. Yeah, did bring the stopwatch? <laughs> we didn't even yeah. set a timer yet, did we? Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> we'll pay attention Let me now. Know I <laughs> mm -hmm. You were going to talk about Israel. Oh, I am. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. what do you want to say about Israel? Well, what's going on? And yeah. just, you know, we've heard well, a little I mean, bit we're, from. Well, we're not, you know, certainly not up to date on a lot of the news that's been happening, but uh, I know that. 
the uh, ground invasion has been, you know, they're being pre they're preparing for that and understand about the hostages that uh, they're hoping to get those released and maybe somehow using the ground invasion as a negotiation piece and all that. But um, it, it looks like you know, that's what's going to happen. And there's a long history. We talked about it today with our group, um, just about the history of the whole Gaza Strip and the West Bank and uh, you know how how things developed and beginning with the Israeli state in 1949 and um, so it's a complicated long process to discuss and I'm not sure I could well do no we don't really want to do the long complicated <laughs> but I mean we've uh, talked to yeah. the Jadones in Nazareth and yeah. how are they doing they I think they're okay I mean they're Inam said just a couple of days ago that it's they're they're worried. I mean, I've never heard her say that before. Usually, it's just something that they they're accustomed to with those rockets that come from Gaza. But this is more, much more involved, and lots of prayers and um, just praying that. Well, we did hear word back from the lady that we work with over there, uh, who lives in a place called Suhadasa, which is just southwest of Jerusalem, and she was uh, taking her grandson to a tennis lesson. So you know some semblance of normalcy uh, seems to be emerging there, but they're all, I think, still on pins and needles about, you know, what's going to happen and the world affairs, who's going to get involved in this and what are the ramifications in terms of all these other nations that, that uh, you know, may join on and, uh, you know, join up sides and, you know, what this thing might erupt into. But um, anyway. I noticed the U.S. presence with like battleships and their staging mm -hmm. all around to maybe keep some of the nations from from going further. Well, and I, I mean, I know this isn't a podcast to focus on the political aspects of all that, but I want to say that from my judgment and my perspective, you know, you've got a, a very radical terrorist organization that's in charge of, been in charge of Gaza and Hamas, and uh, they've just been nothing but a thorn in the side of Israel, and uh, it's just not right for terrorism and the acts of you know, that they've committed against humanity and the abuse of human rights and all of that. I mean, I'm not saying that anybody's perfect on any side of the, the whole issue, but, uh, but there have been some terrible things that have been going on, and they've, they've really kept uh, the people of Gaza, I think, um, you know, enslaved in a lot of ways. So. Yeah. Well, many prayers for, for that situation. Okay. Do you have anything else on that? No, I actually have a random thing I was going to say that has nothing to do with what we've been talking about. But in case you're curious, we're actually recording this in our cabin, Neil and my cabin. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's the backdrop. The other day when we recorded, we were in a much louder place. Yeah. So we were just trying to find somewhere quiet. So if you're curious about what you're looking at, that's what you're looking mm -hmm. at. Yeah. And now we can talk about more serious things. This is not our personal art. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, interesting. We have an elephant. Uh, it's an elephant sitting on the beach, staring at a ship that's sailing away. And I'm not real sure what the symbolism is, but it's, 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 it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So what has been your favorite thing that you have eaten? Oh, uh -huh. okay. On ship or off ship? Both. Hmm. So on ship, I'm going to say um, the creme brulee. Here. They've served it twice and I've had it twice mm -hmm. because it's the best I've ever had. Mm -hmm. Off ship was when we were in Bodrum. 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 How are we? In you Turkey. Say? Our in Turkey. Turkish stop. Yeah. And we stopped for breakfast and the, I don't even, it was a traditional Turkish breakfast kind of a thing, but it was a fried egg that came out and it's separately in a little silver pan and then a big platter that was filled with about three different types of cheeses and walnuts and dried apricots and tomatoes and cucumbers. That cheese stick thing. Um, oh yeah, there was a, that it was pastry. almost like a big long fried mm -hmm. cheese Just stick. Like it was rolled yes. up in some sort of flaky dough. And then at the top was, um, what was it? butter, uh, a kind yeah. of jam. Yeah, that's what it was. Preserves and then olives and then honey and butter and then regular butter. And when they when they serve it to you, first of all, it's beautifully presented, but then they come to the table and they say, would you like olive oil on it? And they drizzle it table side. Mm -hmm. So what about 50 pieces of bread? And fresh squeezed orange juice, oh, yeah. which 
tasted amazing. So that's wow. been my favorite. Yeah, and you got pictures of that, so you'll yes, be able to share I it next did. week. Yeah. I took a lot of food, but mm -hmm. well, I don't know. We had salmon ravioli that was pretty incredible yesterday. But those two words don't go together to me. Oh, it was amazing. Oh, it was smoked salmon inside of a really tender ravioli with this creamy sauce. It was. That was in that little munch. Fantastic. Yeah. Cypress. Yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Neil? That, yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to say that the the off ship options were the same because I also ordered the same mm -hmm. thing she did, and we shared a little meal yesterday, and I think that's right. Uh, on the ship, that little tart thing we had, the lemon thing. Oh, oh, that yeah. Was also a dessert. It was, was a lemon sure. tart yeah. where the meringue was about this mm -hmm. thick. It was piled on so high. Mm -hmm. There was like 46 dessert options every night. Yeah. I only get one. Uh, some, some people don't. I only get one at a time, maybe? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. We, we, I mean, on a ship, you can order whatever you yeah, want, as many as you as want. As many appetizers, as many entrees, mm -hmm. wow. as many desserts. Sometimes so we fun. get, yeah, sometimes we get each get our own appetizer and then share one. But mm -hmm. sometimes you've ordered like two appetizers and no main dish. Yeah, I'll skip the entree mm -hmm. and order two appetizers and two desserts. And Yeah. One time we counted up how many desserts we'd had in a day and it was yeah. shocking. On an unrelated note, what's the uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the weight limit on this case. <laughs> we shall not talk about there it. There are weight limits in the elevator when you get in and off. Yeah. And it it deems. Yeah, I, I haven't well. noticed in the ship listing the one side. <laughs> <laughs> Which side would that be? I think it's all because we're on the other side of the ship. It's on the Pollard side, right? Well, I was going to say, so I think toward the end of the cruise, you can fit fewer people on the elevator because we all weigh more. <laughs> so. Yeah. On the way up here, that's when the elevator, we had just gotten on and then Brian and Shannon got on and, and it said, the weight limit has been exceeded in this elevator. Please ask the last person to step off. <laughs> Brian and Shannon were off in a shot. They, they I mean, it wasn't oh, them. I mean, no. it was, I, we've seen lots more people on those elevators than that time, but mm -hmm. it was a little embarrassing. Tetris with much softer objects. Uh -huh. Yeah. So what about you? What's your, fa your favorite that you've eaten? I'll tell you, I'm not nearly as sophisticated as you guys and that beautiful <laughs> culinary description I was like wow it's not vegetables well, for sure been on Royal Caribbean's you know a little <laughs> app to entice people to go to that place but listen anyway. you talk about history and politics and I'll talk about <laughs> food okay <laughs> well man that was really um so yeah this tells you a little bit about myself I guess so when we came down they already from, all know about you from anyway. the Acropolis at Rhodes, mm -hmm. and we told everybody, look, we're not going to eat for a while, so if you have time, grab something quick on the way down. Well, we we saw this little shop, what was it, is it? Euro. Euro, yeah. Right? Euro? G-Y-R-O, Euro, I think. So, it's anyway, it's like flatbread with, you know, some uh, shawarma meat that was the chicken. It's chicken. Yeah, and... Uh, and they put threw some french fries in there and part of it was probably we were famished because we had hiked all the way up there and hiked all the way down and we were hurrying and and um, i was like wow this thing is really good the fries so, were in the yeah, yes. fries were in it and uh mm -hmm. i don't know there are a few condiments inside as well but uh, yeah and so we kind of the other thing and i have to, i feel really bad about this because i was i thought if i get because we told her about you've got to be back at the bus by noon and, and it, the bus was way up on this hill, okay? So down from the Acropolis, way back up on the hill. And I got to thinking, I hope everybody got the message because we kind of did that word of mouth. Remember, we're like, mm -hmm. hey, everybody, just go tell everybody. We're not going to eat for several hours. So, you know, just on the way down, if you want to grab a little snack, real quick, just get it. And I got to thinking after I got there, what if everybody didn't get the message? And I show up with this big thing. You know, <laughs> and I can't be late by showing Walk up and up. eating it. So, <laughs> We were like eating it, cramming it, and running up that hill and everything. Yeah, it just felt so wrong having this cardio exercise going on while I'm shoving yeah. french fries in my mouth yeah. at the same yeah. time. Yeah. That was amazing, though. Yeah. It was really well, good. Well, I want to interject really quickly that we did not get a chance to grab a snack on that time. One of our, the members of our group was feeling lightheaded and not mm -hmm. feeling very well, and we were kind of hanging back with her and, and taking care of things. And so when I got on the bus, everybody's noshing on all this stuff, and we knew it was going to be a few hours before we could eat, and I was starving. And I just stood up on the back of the bus and said, does anybody back here have snacks? <laughs> Did anyone? Sure. Sure. We had all kinds. We had awesome. all kinds. People were like, I've got a granola bar, and I've got this, and I've yeah. got trail mix. And well, later on, I didn't realize I had done this, but somebody told me that I pushed down Neil's head. <laughs> That all they saw, he was wearing a cap, ball cap, and all they saw was me pushing down on his head, standing up, going, "Does anybody have snacks back here?" 
<laughs> first things first. Uh, <laughs> pretty usual. Yeah. 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 Foodie, yeah. Um, well, what a, so on on ship. Favorite. Last night, I don't know the name of it, but that roast. Oh, oh it was just yeah. roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it was outstanding. Which pudding was not? It didn't look like a pudding it at all. It looked like, like a, a little popover. Yeah. And you picked it up and ate it. It wasn't. It was totally different than yeah. what I thought. Yeah. yeah. I was just very. very you keep using myself. this word. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think of me and what you think of me. Uh -huh. Okay. And you? Um, ooh. <laughs> Probably the off ship would be that chicken gyro because mm -hmm. it was really good. It was like grilled, but it was. I mean, We're it's easy grilled. To please, I can tell yeah. You right well, it's that shaved meat, and yeah. so it was. Yeah. Good white meat chicken. Probably because y'all miss Israel so much, and that sounds shawarma like a too. very yeah, type. Israeli kind but of But I don't like shawarma in Israel very much. And, mm. ooh, it was good. Yeah. And then on ship, um, there have been lots of good. That French onion soup is to die for, and they're having it again tonight. So we, you and I laugh because <laughs> <laughs> one of the first things we do in the morning is log on to the app and see what the menu is for dinner yeah. that night. I'll so say it to me, do you want to hear tonight's menu? <laughs> we're well, comparing. What, what's weird about that for this trip, because we've been on one other cruise before, mm -hmm. well, two others, but one other where First we did one a Bible, you know, Bible Lands cruise in 2018, and we never went to the dining room. And uh, we went one time, and we, you know, they set us by somebody we really didn't know, mm -hmm. and I just felt funny, you know, they were, and we just thought, we, we yeah. loved the setting of that last one where we could go up to the, the, the dining hall, not the dining hall. Well, we went through the, 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 kind of the buffet line, buffet. but there was an outdoor yeah. seating area where yeah. we could watch the sunset. Yeah. And, so we really weren't looking forward to going to the dining room, and when we went, yeah. it was like, it's pretty good. Yeah. So now we're not really forward to here, so it's it kind of a neat setting. Yeah. And you're pampered. Oh. You're pampered. Yeah. Yes, our waiter's yeah. name is Ajit, mm -hmm. and we were trying to figure out how we can get an Ajit back home because he just waits on his hand and foot and wants us to be happy and says, "Are you happy? Can I bring how you something?" How can I make you happy? Well, as if he doesn't was it us. was it delicious? Was it? Yeah, what he, calls, what he, he brings you. Neil drinks like a camel. Um, do camels drink a lot? <laughs> tea. And he will bring him out three glasses of tea at once. Mm -hmm. They anticipate. Well, just so he doesn't have to, to continually bring yeah. you another fresh glass. I guess glass. I'm going to have to do that for him mm -hmm. from now on. That well, John has agreed to call me Ma'am Carla from now on. Ma'am Carla. Oh, and I ask me that. And ask me how can I make you happy every night at dinner, right? Well, I do that all the time. Uh -huh. so. Yeah, well. Sir Neil. <laughs> if you call him Sir John. Yeah, well, we can try it. Sir we'll see John. how it works out. Sounds very crusader, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am Carla we doesn't sound crusader. Something about John and castles and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. It fits. Which, by the way, that is one of the neatest things mm -hmm. about this trip also. Just all the different history, right? You know, we're seeing mm -hmm. from, different periods, uh, different places. Do you yeah. get a sense they're stalling the personal questions I that we're wanting so. to ask them? Yeah. I think you're about out of time, aren't you? Uh, no, so. we have oh, plenty no. of hey, time. Hey, this is our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Yeah. We can go for as long as we want. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that's kind of par for the course, right? Is what we hear. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't know for sure. Right. Y'all use a calendar to <laughs> record the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah Ru uh, Neil compared us to Roots and what was the other one? Gone with the Gone Wind with the one wind. time, yeah. I think we've already covered that. Exactly. Moving right along. <laughs> it's been fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, yes. we are have had fun with y'all and just getting to know the other people on the cruise. That's, that's mm -hmm. the best part of the fellowship. Mm -hmm. Last night, the singing, oh. that was amazing. And we've been meeting up on deck, what, 14 every night and singing mm -hmm. as a group. And then we've had visitors and we had that's some... 12 or 15 yeah. last night from mm -hmm. Canada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've enjoyed it. Okay. So you want to move into the, the good stuff now? The nitty gritty. Okay. Now this is where you say, cut to... <laughs> 40 minutes, right? This is where the real stuff starts. If you're not <laughs> interested in the yeah. dead chat. What I think Neil has referred to as blather before. Uh -huh. He comes he comes yeah, up with his I own descriptive that. words. Yeah. Okay. Let's matriculate past the blue cheese. And then <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving right along. Neil. <laughs> I, was that a reference to my stinky blue cheese? <laughs> I don't, yeah. <laughs> you told him. No, yes. I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Yeah. Are you going to explain? No, no, I already did. I, no, I did. No, no. So it's not a big deal, <laughs> but big deal. I had a grilled well, cheese <laughs> right before we met up here. Let's and my, <laughs> why? Is it boorish? No. Yeah, yeah it's, it's boorish. And oh, we got John Moore to say boorish on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and? Unrefined. 
No, immature. immature. No. That's oh, immature or unrefined. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, no, <laughs> immature is how you mm -hmm. Anyway, so I had blue cheese on my sandwich, and it got on my finger, and I just said to Kathy that my fingers smell like blue cheese, and she said, oh, that is not a good finger smell. <laughs> so that's well, what we're laughing what about. happened after that. What the happened after that? The uncontrollable laughter that oh. went on for minutes. That was... Yeah. That, that's, that's such why I a rare I would thing. Stick it in this episode. That's just a rare thing. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Neil. Anyways, okay. Anyways. Yeah. So glad you're here. We digress. Well, again, again, we digress. Okay. So you're looking at my notes, and you're not supposed to be looking at my I notes. I was staring off into space. And that <laughs> happens to be right here at my notes. But I mean, we're going to say good, wonderful things about you two, and mm -hmm. I'm starting to rethink that. I feel like we need to scrap that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just go, go straight the to the hard questions, yeah. right? No, we won't do that. But I, I was thinking we were talking about this. I, I, you know, we talk about how similar we are sometimes, but we also talk about how similar y'all are, mm -hmm. and in a good way. You're mm -hmm. looking Sweet. both looking nervous, yes. So I was just jotting down some things that I think are very similar about the two of you, and they're they are good. So I really am switching to serious. But y'all are both looking at me like I'm about to say something. Yeah, completely serious here. But. The number one, and I want you to jump in here too, the things that you noticed. Number one is that the two of you both love and honor God above all else and above all other people. That's your number one priority in life. And, and uh, you know, Kathy and I do often talk about how blessed we are to have husbands who, who honor God. And that makes all the difference in, in our marriage and in our families and in the churches that we uh, are associated with. And so we're very grateful mm -hmm. and blessed by that. Both of you are preachers and teachers. I think that Neil, your, yours is more preaching and John's is more teaching, but I think a, even in that way, y'all, when you work together, you enhance each other because you both have those strengths. Both of you are easygoing and likable, and both of you are, I mean, <laughs> y'all are <laughs> blushing. Mm -hmm. This is kind of fun. I think it's blood pressure. <laughs> You're both family men. You're both lifelong learners, you know, both of you are constantly learning, going to school, you know, wanting to go to school if you're not going to school. Uh, both of you love history, both of you are interested in people. What do you think, Kathy? What do you, did I take all, all? Well, the interested in people, the one that comes to my mind the most is how you both bring out the best in others. And I think that is such a people skill. And um, you, especially with group dynamics and all the different personalities, you keep everybody involved, you keep everybody encouraged, you give some you give them something to look up to and live up to and um, it's a real strength and a real talent that you both have. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so would you like to comment on all those compliments or no? <laughs> uh. I mean would we really be humble? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. That's very kind. As you each know about us, there's, we're far from perfect, and we know it. And so, uh, appreciate that. Thank well, I am. I am curious. One of my questions was how both of you could pretty much get along with anyone, and could you maybe speak a little bit to how you think? Uh, do you consider yourselves pretty much able to get along with anyone, everyone? I, I think, I certainly, and I know Neil. I've seen him do this as well. It's it, it really is about just loving people because we're all made in the image of God, number one. And number two, every one of us has flaws. Every one of us has problems. And I, I've come to understand that over time. I mean, I used to get, I guess, early on in my life and, and for many years thereafter, irritated about certain things. And I still do. You know, we're all human. We, sometimes you just kind of reach a level with, you know, with people and you go, okay, I just need some alone time. And, but, but I think more than anything, and, and these trips have taught us this, is that expectations or thoughts that we had about certain people, and then when you're with them, sure, after a while, you know, you, again, we need a little long time, but you realize there's not one single person that's perfect out there. And a trip like this will highlight some of those things that, you know, we all have that are problems, but it also shows us, you know, when I'm impatient or when, you know, I get frustrated about things and it just, uh, if I'm this way, why, how can I expect everybody else to be perfect? You know, so I need to be patient with others and, mm -hmm. and just to love on people because the Lord loves 
sinners. He loved Judas, you know, scary. And I think about if he loved someone like that, then I can love my brethren and must, you know. So. Yeah. Well, I think in ministry and mission work, you find out how people are the same no matter where you go on the earth. They have the same drives, same fears, same needs. And the more you spend time with them, the more you come, you can come to understand what may be behind uh, a surface interaction or response that seems more negative when you begin to get to know them better. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes that's the hard part is getting past the, you know, if somebody's a porcupine, getting past all of that to see there's probably behind that uh, a hurt or uh, right. something that they need and that God places these people in our path. I had, some years ago, I had a conversation with Alan Webster that was very helpful for me. And I know this, he didn't invent this. It was the first time I'd actually ever heard it. He said, hurt people Mm -hmm. hurt people. Mm -hmm. And the people that can be more obnoxious or harder to deal with, you'll probably find there's a hurt underneath there. And in that same conversation, he talked about an experience he'd had in which somebody kind of spewed on him. And then somebody came along uh, and was commiserating and trying to get him to say something bad about that person. And he said, well, I'm I'm just thankful. And And it's in the packaging. There was no sarcasm. I was thankful that I was there to be the one that that happened to. Mm. And, um, you know, those kinds of, those kinds of impressions, if we, can, if we can keep those front of mind, help us with people who may be more difficult to deal with. And you can make it your challenge to, I'm going to wear that person down, I'm going mm-hmm. to get past that barrier. And it doesn't always work, but it's, it helps, you know. Um, the other way it's not going to help meet antagonism with antagonism. Yeah. yeah, I've seen you do that with uh, make them your project. I don't know if you've ever worded it quite that way, but nurses, there was one particular nurse in the hospital that you had to kind of, she was not happy in her work. No, she was an angry elf. <laughs> <laughs> but I decided, yeah, that I was You didn't call her an angry elf, oh, did no, you? Oh, of course not. But, not to her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, so what? I mean, I, I, to me, it, those are just, it's, it's biblical. They're biblical principles of returning good for evil. That's what God has called us to do. We talk about that in our marriage seminars a lot, that the way you change lives, the way you make a difference is not to return evil for evil, but to return good for evil. You know, when Jesus was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was threatened, he threatened not, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. And so when we do that, uh, it works. It helps. I mean, yeah, there, there are situations where people just reject you and, you know, are going to blow you off, as it were. But you know what? We've done our part. But, um, and, and we don't do it for any, you know, self-gratification in the sense of, you know, look what I've done. It's a matter of we want people to see Jesus. And if we trust in his plan and trust in the way he says to, to honor people and to do, you know, to do good to others, to love our enemies, you know, to... Uh, pray for them that despitefully use us and persecute us and say all manner of evil against us falsely. Um, that's the Lord's plan, and it works. It works. Well, I think there's an aggressive, I don't know, maybe the wrong word, an aggressive side to this. That person can be an impediment to the success if we're talking about the local work or even on, not that we had the experience on this trip, but you sometimes you have those dynamics to where you're trying to break that down for the good of everybody else. And so, um, you try to use the biblical principles that will help to short circuit what could really change the the mood and the, the the objectives that you have for the success of whatever it is you're doing. If it's a work in the local work, or if it's a day on a on an excursion. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, how do you handle it when when there's somebody that just rubs you the wrong way? Kill them with kindness. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know if there's one answer to that. Yeah. I mean, some of that depends on the, the temperament and the personality of the, per, of the other person. I have found sometimes it's better to, not in a rude way, but to ignore or to set boundaries so that they, they can't use ugliness to get their, their way or to mm-hmm. be bullish or uh, overly aggressive. Others, I think we can love it out of them. And sometimes you get it wrong. You try one and mm-hmm. you, they need the other, maybe. Yeah, because I just think, you know, sometimes 
there are people that just personally rub you the wrong way and then there's people that just do that to everyone you know but I think that's kind of what you're talking about with the hurt people do hurt people mm -hmm. that maybe something's behind it mm -hmm. you jump in here I feel like I'm dominating uh, I'm just amused because I've been listening to these guys answer your questions and like scripture just flows from their mm -hmm. lips well just like it says in verse blah 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 mm -hmm. and when we do it we're going what's that what's verse that? where How's it going? <laughs> yeah. what's that verse mm -hmm. I think somewhere in so they're the pros but uh, I w also thought about I think it's the Jane Austen movie Emma where a uh, personality is brought onto the scene that Emma, of course, doesn't like. She rubs her the wrong way. And she says, there's only one thing to do. I must throw her a party. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, it kind of goes back to your joking answer of killing with kindness. But that, that becomes almost a spiritual growth opportunity or a challenge to... I know that I'm responding unfavorably to this type of personality, but I can go out of my way to be extra cheerful or friendly or warm around them and either something good will come from that which might be a great friendship or at least I can walk away not regretting how I treated them yeah, yeah there was maybe a, what God's trying to do in you right so much yeah like right and being aware of that you know that there there is a lot of things lacking in me that's a that's a good that's a good point mm -hmm. but I know we've talked about this before but when when you spend time with someone that you don't like a whole lot, you end up almost always coming away liking them more than you did before. Mm -hmm. That's happened several times. Um, and, and maybe not someone that we disliked, but just kind of, mm, just didn't really want to be around. Yeah. Well, and, and being careful about uh, presuppositions or judgments about people early on. And we, we've, if anything that we've learned on these trips and dealing with people, it's, it's been that. And I know in the church as well, somebody comes in and they're a new person and, and you may form this opinion of them and, uh, and we gotta be careful about that because like you said, there may be some things down deep that are going on or we're not seeing them in their, you know, their total context. But um, you know, we've had emails and information, you know, there's certain personality types out there that need to know a lot of things or are kind of a little pushy maybe or whatever. And just corresponding with them, we think, oh, what's this going to be like when we get on this trip and, and be with this person? But it's been fascinating to me to see that every time, every time that we got on these trips and those people that we were worried about are people that we fell in love with, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so you just never know what blessings God has in store for you if you just are patient and, you know, willing to forgive. And, and not even, it wasn't so much about forgiveness as it was just, not judging ahead of time or, 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 you know, discounting someone in some way. And because they love the Lord and these people are coming on these trips, they love the Lord. That's a part of why they're here. And you already have that in common. So you need to, you know, cultivate that, I guess. Yeah. Well, something I know that you are good at, and, you know, I don't know this about you because I don't know people, situations that y'all have encountered, but people that have mistreated you and you're able to, you know, whether it's in words or uh, attitudes or things that you've found out that they've said to other people about you, and you treat them with kindness. And I have such a hard time with that. You know, I, I may not treat them unkindly, but I I avoid them. And you don't do that. You, you'll go out of your way to greet them, and and uh, I don't know if that's just a, what you're thinking. Well, not all the time. I mean, I, I appreciate you saying that, but there, there are times when I, I think this is what we all need to remember about ourselves is that sometimes physiologically we're just tired, you know, we don't feel well. Uh, you know, we all have a, maybe a point in which we just kind of have a breaking point in, you know, in dealing with situations. And I found that on this trip a few times, not with any of our, our passengers that are in our group, but just you know, people of the world or whatever. And uh, just because I'm tired and I wasn't in the best frame of mind to receive it, and I didn't respond in the way that I wanted to. So we're all human, we make mistakes. And, yeah. you know. I think one thing I love about you both, even in light of relationships and people, is um, you both naturally keep the main thing the main thing. And um, if we were to use an example like this cruise that we've been on, there are things that happen that maybe test our patience or make us tired or you know there might be inconveniences here and there things are bound to happen on any trip and you both seem to have this knack of 
here's a golden opportunity to invite these people in and have them sing with us. Here's a golden opportunity to invite them to join us in our worship service on Sunday morning. Here's a teaching opportunity. And I always feel like I'm reeled back in. You know, I might be sitting there thinking, oh, man, I can't believe blah, 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 blah. And you guys have such a natural knack for seeing the big picture and remember what this is all about. Mm -hmm. It's not about those little things that should fall in order or be convenient. The big picture is we're learning more about God's world and his people and the land of the Bible and, and, um, and the opportunities that have opened because of it. And I always feel like when you do that, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that's why we're here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's right. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I really appreciate that. It's, it's that. it's that literal living, keep looking up, you know, kind of influence that you wield. Yeah. Well, you said that. I, here's something that I learned on this trip that I, I feel like I, I don't want to inc not inconvenience somebody, but I guess just make someone else feel uncomfortable unintentionally. Um, the singings, for example, when we first talked about well, getting together, finding a place in the boat, because we had places reserved during the day, uh, but not at night. They couldn't provide for us a place at night. So we were looking for a place where we could gather and just kind of talk and you know, have some quietness. And uh, we thought, well, is it, is it going to seem strange to people that we start singing and they're going to be bothered by that? And I was a little worried that <laughs> people are going to go, why are they doing that? They're, you know, they're in they're infringing on our privacy up here, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't be too excited if you know the Muslim uh, prayer call, you know, erupted or something while we're outside. So, you know, I kind of think from that perspective. And uh, but yet, when we all started getting together, here's how God blesses you, and how you realize that there are other people that appreciate those kinds of things, as long as you're not offensive and you know, and and being rude about it. But we were in a private kind of area on the ship, and they could have walked on by us, and they did, but. I was amazed to think. I was amazed to think about how many people stopped. Mm -hmm. Little kids, taking yeah. video, teenagers yeah. taking videos, yeah, mm -hmm. little kids stopping and they were participating. It was neat. Yeah. It was really neat. And then, and then more and more. And the singing has just been absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, it's been a joy to see people who are willing to publicly share their faith like that in that kind of setting. So. An mm -hmm. unashamed demonstration. Yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah. see any showiness. You know, I couldn't read a heart anyway. But I think it's people who are, there's, a, there's the strength in our group that we feel from one another and doing this together unashamedly. And it's faith affirming to see other people who yeah. share mm -hmm. that and appreciate it. If there's been a negative thing, they've kept it to them, themselves. It mm -hmm. seems to be very positive. Yeah. And, that was, and that's an aside from everything else. Mm -hmm. It's an, you know, just a side benefit, yeah. it seems. One other question that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is another similarity that both of you share, that both of you stand for truth without coming across as harsh or um, combative, or I don't know whether words to use, but both of you share that, that blessing that I think is a talent too. And do you, do you see that? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And how, how do you think you are able to do that? either one of you well I, I'll just say that a big influence a, a mentor in my young preaching life and I think we're the product of that my first mentor was my dad that my mm -hmm. dad preached almost 60 years full-time um, and he he's of such high character um, I, I, I appreciate I appreciate from him seeing a consistency but also a, a humility he's been a learner you know he's his next birthday will be 80 and he's all, he never just acts like he's got everything figured out. Um, but my next mentor was Wendell Winkler. Mm -hmm. And Wendell Winkler, at least in the time of life that I knew him, was big in, in talking about, you know, the sound doctrine for daily living. Mm -hmm. he, he was, he was, he emphasized balance and how important it was to speak the truth in love and don't let either one of those uh, overshadow or eclipse or substitute for the other. And um, watching him do that in some very difficult situations, knowing some of his personal circumstances and what he went through, some of that I learned later in life, and how he, uh, he, would, he would preach those, and he would tell us, you, there are difficult sermons, subjects that you've got to preach that will not be popular. You may be standing alone. 
but he says, if you're not kind, you're the wrong kind. You can be mm-hmm. right and be wrong. A lot of things like that, that that when you're training to preach, it really makes an impression on you. Um, and so, um, not not that I've done that like I should, but he, I, I always, always heard his, his voice a lot and, and that mm-hmm. particular emphasis because that was a big one of his. Mm. What about you, John? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... Uh, Probably there were some that influenced me early on to think that anytime something false was said by anybody, that you had to immediately correct it or you weren't standing for the truth. And uh, so, you know, someone calls you a pastor, for example, you know, well, but if you don't write in and say, oh, listen, uh, I'm not a pastor, I'm a preacher or whatever, you know, and so forth. And, and yet this person may not have known us from Adam. And, uh, but, but I was sort of made to feel that way, not by my parents or, you know, or your father or like that, but it just, maybe it was a false impression. But there is almost, I felt like that sort of paradigm that you have to operate out if you're gonna be a, a quote, a faithful Christian in the, in the eyes of some. But then I began to realize that, you know, I, I was expecting people to understand something, but they didn't have a framework to even begin to understand it. You know, they just saw you as being, a, you know, like, you know, yeah, or argumentative, or you know, or just uh, obtuse. Huh? Obtuse. obtuse. You know, yeah. Instead of developing a relationship with people, that then they could would listen to you. You know, and I, I think sometimes it's like we, we can't expect non-Christian people to act in a Christian way, and for us to just jump all over them about something by the way that they're doing wrong. I think it's problematic. Now that's different from me saying when if I'm asked what I believe or if I have an opportunity to stand for what's right and I can do it and I speak the truth in love then I must do it. Um, that balance is, you know, I realize is, is challenging and always knowing you know, how to let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So answering every man doesn't mean that I always need to say something right away because Jesus didn't always say something right away when someone was doing something that, you know, he asked questions or he listened, you know, and uh, uh, looked for the right opportunity. But I, that may not be exactly what you're asking about, I yeah. guess. But I know one thing that, uh, talking about, your, you know, your dad, my dad, I felt like he wasn't a preacher, but well, he, he, loved, was. he loved people. In a different way. And he, and he had, I think, a greater influence on the non-Christian more so than I ever have had as a preacher because he connected with people and he was interested in them. Whereas I thought that if I didn't right away, you know, talk to them about, you know, their relationship with God, that I wasn't, again, being faithful. Whereas he, he was friendly with people, you know? And, and maybe that says more about me and what I thought and what I shouldn't have been thinking about stuff. And as opposed to, I don't know, I just really appreciated his example about just enjoying being with people and talking to them or whatever and then letting his good works shine and then as the opportunity presented itself then to talk mm-hmm. to them about Jesus and yeah. Well you're both relationship builders. Um, you remember people in situations that I mean I know you can remember names that I could not imagine. It's getting harder. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you just, you find, you ask people about themselves, you know, one of your immediate questions to everyone is, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Even in situations when I think you probably shouldn't, like, you know, police officers in airports and things, they don't really need to tell you where they're from. They might always think, they're going to think he's stalking them or, you know, uh, but anyway, yeah, I I just think you're both. I want to say just a little something about there's two fr- fronts, I think, in, in this, and, and maybe they're not exactly the same. In local work, one of the ways that you can um, achieve that balance is by being there for people, um, whether it's opening your office for counseling or being there when they're going through the hurts, when the births and the deaths and the crises that come along. And as you, as you take that approach to ministry, then they'll know when you preach on Matthew 19.9 or, or Colossians 3.16 or, or any, you know, any number of examples we could give, they know that you care and that you have their, their interest at heart. Mm-hmm. On the brotherhood level, I've learned that to be measured, 
um, to be working on being encourager, an encourager, and building relationships, um, but realize you don't always have to answer your critics, mm -hmm. and you certainly don't respond in kind when they're they're not kind, because again, I, I feel like I quote Brother Winkler a lot. But Luke seven thirty six, wisdom is justified of her children. I know that's not exactly the context there, but this whole idea that there are people on the sidelines watching between you and somebody else, and if they're ugly and you try to respond like Christ, the discerning people, or ultimately they're going to know, hopefully, when you try to live with the right kind of character, they'll, they'll be able to see the difference, hopefully. Yeah. And if not, the Lord will sort that out, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything? I'm going to go on to the next question, unless you... You can go on to the next okay. question. Well, I really, what I really wanted to kind of focus in on. I know we probably have there already... There are 22 questions on here. I see. You're going to go long and we're going to be on here and you're going to blame us. Yeah. You're going to say, you're no better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Eight o'clock already? <laughs> this, I think, is something else that you both have excelled at and, and that is at being fathers. And you're both the fathers of three sons, which means we're the mothers of three sons. Um, you both have the respect of all three of your sons. Um, I think it would be great to hear, I have several different questions, and I think you do too, Kathy, or you'll come up and have some. Um, what is, what do you consider the most important aspect of fatherhood as far as, um, I, I, obviously raising them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, but how, practically speaking, how, what do you think are some things, you know, if, if you could speak to young fathers today, what? would you tell them is a very important aspect of fatherhood? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'll be the first to admit that I'm far from what I needed to be and should be even now as a father. And, and uh, you know, I guess I, I look back with a lot of regrets and wish that I would have done things differently here and there and maybe not been as hard in some areas, but harder in others, you know. And, and uh, you know, we ne none of us, uh, you know, grow into perfect fatherhood to begin with we're going to make some mistakes and we're grateful for the grace of God but what I think makes the changes because every father makes those mistakes but what the, the difference is is to show unconditional love to your children always that um, you shower them with a lot of affection and that give them a sense of, of uh, you know of, of self-esteem that they are important and that you're willing to listen. And part of, I think, how we do that is to uh, encourage, to listen, to when they're doing certain things, we compliment them, you know, and, and we don't uh, try to compare them to anybody else. And we uh, look at their particular skills and uh, their personality and celebrate those things that they're good at. Um, so uh, I think, it, and then and being willing to say that I was wrong and I'm sorry and, um, I don't know, I just think love covers a multitude of sins. And again, I may be taking that a little out of context there, but the point is, is that, that if our children know that they are loved and valued, it will cover over a lot of mistakes that we make. Because mm -hmm. we all need to be affirmed. We all That's need right. to know that we're important and valued. Right. Mm -hmm. so. I, would, I mean, I would say a lot of the same things. Um, I remember it was hard for me to have, to, I told, I don't know if y'all ever had this moment, but when I, I went off to college, I, I was a youth minister in Babinette, Alabama. I remember it was on a Saturday afternoon. I picked up the phone, you know, with the rotary mm -hmm. dial, and, did all that. <laughs> and, I, and I called my parents, and I proceeded to confess to about two or three pretty big things. And I, I never have asked them after the fact. I know, at least in my mind, I, I'd gotten away with this, and they didn't know it. But they acted so unsurprised and loving and encouraging and I remember that I mean I haven't you know I hadn't even met Kathy yet um, and I remember there the boys had some big moments in life where I know it had to be very hard for them to, to own up to that and um, it, it made a big difference and I think we're, we're afraid of what's going to happen when we're kids growing up and when we find empathy, understanding, and, gen and, and and I think that that makes a big difference when it builds a relationship 
and that unconditional love, I said, maybe you think, because we're all sinners who are going to make some huge mistakes along the way. It's the sins, and we need, we need that. And I, I think all I would add to that is there's no substitute for time. You know, the whole quality versus mm -hmm. quantity time. Uh, and I'm like John. I feel like there's a lot of things I should have done and I need to do better than I have. But I enjoyed having the opportunity several times when they were growing up to take them with me on gospel meetings, mission trips, and just experiencing that together and having time in the evening. And Kathy's always encouraged me to, to continue to grow uh, as a dad, and, and I, I appreciated the, the spurring on that she did. And I don't know, as a result of some conversation we had, um, came up with the idea of going and praying with the boys every night. It seemed like a little thing. I didn't even know if they cared about it, but they've talked about that looking back. But at the end of their day, uh, in that way, me asking them, well, what's going on? What can you pray about? So being sure to admit your imperfection and your need for growth and letting them know that you don't think you've got it figured out helps them, I think. And now y'all three of your guys are, are on the other side of this and, and two of ours are as dads and, and, and uh, I guess that's, that's how I would answer it. You know, um, something I, and I, I wouldn't have known how to identify it in terms of the terminology but I've since learned that my dad was this, what I'm going to share with you, and that is the difference between being the authority in your home and authoritarianism. You know, we are to be the leaders, and we are in, indeed the ones that set the rules, and we, you know, working together as husband and wife, and, and uh, there doesn't need to be any question, you know, in our children's minds about who rules that home, because I've seen too many situations where there were children who ruled their parents, yeah. right? Yeah. All right, so I think parents who are desirous to, to be in control, they want their children to, to live right and to do right, are the authority. But they, they get over into what some call authoritarianism, where people are judgmental, they're harsh, they're critical, they don't see the heart of the child, they only see the mistakes they make. And, uh, and they're very punitive in their nature uh, as opposed to you know, encouraging and reinforcing. So when I, when I saw that terminology used uh, in a book that uh, I can't even think of the title of right now, but um, the difference between authority and authoritarianism, and I shared that with some families one time, and the dad said, well, you know, he just turned to Miriam, so he started crying. He said, that, that's me, that was me. He wanted his children so much to be perfect and he thought, this is what I got to do. I got to correct this and correct that and correct that. And I can't overlook it wrong because then they're going to grow up thinking that this is wrong and, and so forth. And they were always on them about everything. And what they did was they rebelled. And so we've always said, and I got this from a book I read, you know, by, written by Josh McDowell years ago, that rules without relationship equals rebellion. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have a relationship and love and patience and all that, and all we have is rules, they're going to rebel. And uh, so I think that's probably my biggest advice. And I saw in my dad. I knew my dad. When he, when he pointed his finger, you know, I knew. Okay. But I knew that's not all he did. He loved me. He told me how much he, you know, was proud of me and encouraged me in the things that I was good at. And he talked to me. He tried, you know. And so I wanted to follow him because I knew how much he loved me. Mm -hmm. Something that occurs to me. The longer I live, I see passivity in fathers and mothers too, but I don't see that in either of you. I, I know when the boys would get out, to, when you take them to school, you told them every day to be a leader. And I mean, you've shown them how to lead, but you can't really be a passive leader. So I don't know if you can speak any to that as far as avoiding passivity in parenthood, but I just think that's a huge thing. And I see it in, in the, in fathers who husbands who aren't leaders and maybe maybe there's things that we do to I'm sure there are at times that make it hard to lead but but maybe speak a little bit to passivity I may may not be something you've thought of before but but I see it well I still don't think that's an an, an option uh, and I think um, it, it, I don't 
I guess, yeah, you're right. I never thought of it in terms of that. Um, I mean, I'm grateful for the fact that I had a dad um, who was a hard worker in, in, in the work he did, um, but he was engaged, he was present, um, and um, the, he, it was, there was no mistaking who was the leader in our home. And I mean, you can't help but to see from that. I felt that, you know, you learned good and bad from your your parents, but um, and we just tried to maintain a close family, um, and that's a it's a it's a partnership, um, and encouragement of a godly wife goes a long way in that, and I feel like I've been I've been blessed in that way. So it's funny how people use terminology today that. I, I, we probably wouldn't have used when we were kids. Not that it was wrong, but I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot today the word intentional among those who are teaching and parenting. And we probably would have used the word purpose. Would it, mm-hmm. Find a purpose in everything that we're doing. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, talking about passivity, we can just as parents think, oh, okay, I need to go tell them to do this and do that. And we don't really plan. We don't think about activities that are going to reinforce life skills or maybe you know how to get along with people. And so one of the things that looking back on our, our parenting days, we thought about, okay, let's, let's plant a garden. Let's uh, go on a camping trip. Let's have an outdoor Saturday work project, even though, sure, there was value that came from not you know, having some help raking up the leaves and all that, but I also knew this is a, a thing that, that builds cohesion in a family when you work on a project together. And so, uh, again, not regimenting where everything is nothing but rules all day and you know, you've got them doing this and two o'clock it's this and this and this. But on the other hand, there's the extreme of like you're saying where their parents are all involved in their own work and their own lives and their kids are kind of an afterthought. And it can't be that way. We have to plan, we have to be purposeful. We have to think about what's gonna help educate them and mold them most importantly spiritually but then, you know, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That takes thought. That takes planning. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we learned as young parents, um, I'm really I've drawn a blank on who I heard it from, but bringing God into everything, making connections. You know, I think back to the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, and how does that play out practically in the activities that you're involved in, the places that you go. Um, I... A couple of things that, that um, w- we gave some forethought to, intentionality, was when the, the boys started getting to a certain age, you know, we thought if, if you wanted to be baseball or football players, where do you take them? To the ball field. And when the opportunity came up to go to Bear Valley, uh, if, if we wanted them to consider that, what better way than to put them around Bible teachers and students and and have that be uh, an impression that could be made on them uh, all along the way and um, show them there's no greater life than serving the Lord full time. And then in taking them to, um, something we talk about a lot with the boys is we're gonna take them to hospital visits and uh, finding your, your happy place because you go up to a patient and they go with me and. I'm thinking this one new convert in Virginia, and he, uh, uh, hopefully this isn't too graphic for your uh, listeners, but he had an abscess. And every time we went up, he'd go, aren't you see how it is today? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of like, we're, you've got to, you know, but to have them with me, and, you know, sometimes it doesn't smell great. Sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to come up, be, see people in, in different, so they talk uh, about that. Um, but making God a part of, each and every day, and then making them a part of that. Um, is yeah. this something you hope, I think it just kind of it, it becomes instilled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's interesting to me how both of you talk about your dads, mm. and you you learned a lot, and you patterned yourself, maybe unintentionally, although I see a lot of your dad in you, and, and you, even since he's been gone, even more. So just thinking about the, you know, when you have a good dad, you become a good, and not, I know it's not 100% always the same, you know. It's a blessing. Yeah, oh, a but, but what a blessing to have a, a good father to, 
to learn how to be a father and to see the father. You know, I always think about that, how so many kids' impressions of God come from who their earthly father is. Well, like Neil said, I, I do see that as being highly important for parents, for fathers to provide rewarding experiences for their kids spiritually like mm -hmm. that because even though you know no kid and I'm thinking about when you were telling the story I was thinking about one of our boys that did not want to go <laughs> with me to a see a certain sister who was 90 some odd years old you know he was tired he just got out of football practice and he did not want to go and uh, but yeah that was one of the best things that, I think that ever happened to him yeah you know, but, so I made him go, you know, he, he didn't say a word all the way there. He was, you know, he was protesting in his own way. And we got there and, and uh, we, uh, we prayed with that lady and we came outside. And he broke out to cry. It was just, it was, a, it was a life changer for him, you know, because I insisted that he go in the rewarding experience of that, that whole ministry moment changed, changed him in a lot of ways. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good stuff. You have anything you want to add? I can't talk now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, okay. Here's another question for you in that regard then. How can mothers support, um, what, you know, wives, mothers support fathers in training their sons and daughters, not just sons, but daughters? What is it that we do, which might not be a fun thing for y'all to talk about? We can step out of the room and y'all can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> what are things that, that we do as as moms? And I'm, I mean, I can remember some things that you would say to me um, that, you know, that, what, what might we do or say that would, would not help the situation, I guess. Put y'all in a bad position here, sorry. Well, Please don't use personal examples. Well, no, I, I was just going to say, I think, not so you know you're not just talking about discipline or spiritual training it's just the, the wide gamut and of course we're both going to be partial because we're um, we only have boys so uh, there's a whole another facet that's missing from this but God knew it took a father and a mother to make a home and so I think we, we balance each other out and, and sometimes we've done it imperfectly um, we don't, as the men, don't don't lead spiritually like we should. Uh, you know, wives can struggle with trusting. You know, the leadership and decisions that are made. Mm -hmm. You know, one will will think more firm is the way to go, mm -hmm. and one's more nurturing the way. They need all of that. Now, it's it's obviously helpful, and Kathy's always been great about this because I've made some bonehead decisions, or or responses in moments. Maybe is a better way to put it. And she was good about not, not letting that be known, typically, in front of them. <laughs> and then we could go back and we could regroup. And, regroup. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, and, and really I think it's the, it's the wisdom of God. Sometimes I had it all wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably that was the more often. And sometimes she did. And time has proven that. And, but they needed both of that. They needed... They needed a mom who would soften and moderate, you know, and they needed a, a dad that would would prod them and push them, and, and we needed each other to kind of step up in the areas where maybe we were lacking. And so I, I just don't know. It's just the wisdom of God. Sometimes people don't have that situation where they, they um, not even of their own choosing, where there can be a, a mom and a dad in the home doing this. Mm -hmm. But I just don't. It's harder for me to critique what Kathy might have needed to do better because I'm so full of a sense of how I would like to go back and do some things differently. But God uses us together when, when both of our aims is to please Him first. Mm -hmm. he, he uses uh, our temperament. I'm an extrovert. She's an introvert. Uses male, female. Uses all of that and our different backgrounds to, to help and shape and mold them. Hopefully that, that that combines to train them in, in the direction that they're they're bent toward. Yeah. So. Yeah. What did I do wrong? What did you do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> think carefully. I, I, well, I just can't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey, There's just, nothing. Oh, I was just sitting there thinking about all the things you did right. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. No. All right. So move to a little bit of a different topic here. And I just am curious if you could think of one piece of advice that you might pass along to a young man in his Christian walk. What's how would you advise them? Uh, what's a good piece of advice that you would like to pass along to to a young man who's beginning his Christian life? I, I guess I would say, first and foremost, come to know Jesus and really who he is. Because I think, um, just like what John said about that, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, if, if we come to know the Lord, it's going to be easier to keep his commandments. And what John also went on to say about we love because we, he first loved us. And so if we can help people to see more of who Jesus is and to see these help a young person or our son, or whoever it is, to focus their life on getting to know the Lord and cultivating that relationship, then so much of what they do and what follows in life is just going to be much easier for them to be much happier and to be much more motivated to want to serve the Lord. So get to know Jesus. I think that's what we ought to encourage our kids to do and what everybody ought to be doing. Okay. All right, Neil, what do you think? I mean, I think that's great. It's hard to improve on it. I guess I would add to it, everything costs. You know, mm -hmm. you, you think about what your goals are and what you're trying to pursue. Um, I believe God's made us so that we, whatever it is we direct our energy toward, we're, we're going to succeed in that. I mean, the, the book of Ecclesiastes is, is full of admonitions about, you know, you can go down this road, and, and, but what's going to be at the end of that? You may gain something, but what have you lost? And again, that's the purpose question that he finally understands at the end of the book. When it comes to a young dad, if I'm understanding your question right, and a young father, you can pour all your energy and your heart into your work, and you're going to succeed in that, but it will come at a cost. Um, you can devote yourself to trying to give quality time to your family and investment there, and um, it'll cost you in some ways. You know, you think about all the decisions we make and how that there is a cost, but what are we willing to pay looking back on? Yeah. If we can try to have the wisdom and maybe have some mentors that can help us at the end of that, invest in the right way, pay the right costs to get the kind of result that you want. Okay. What do you love the most about him? About Neil? Mm -hmm. You weren't supposed to ask me questions. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Uh, his genuineness. I've always said that pretty much what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. And um, he's, he's not perfect and he's humble about that, but he's perfect for me and Aww. he, He's, when we've been talking all this stuff about him being a people person, that's just who he is. Mm -hmm. And behind closed doors, and he really does love people, and that's what I love most about him. Yeah, and you've helped him with that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so describe your, per your perfect day. Describe my perfect day? Yeah, if you could have a day to do whatever you want to do, how would you spend it? I think it's your turn to go first. <laughs> <laughs> it starts, continues, and ends with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure John feels the same. Oh, oh absolutely. Uh -huh. Ditto. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> We're in there somewhere, but. Yeah. No, describe yeah. your perfect day. I could describe his perfect day. <laughs> <laughs> he just doesn't want to say. No, I just, I don't know if I'm. I'm not sure what all elements go there. Uh, uh, I mean, that's the, the fun thing about life is that there's so many fun different ways that you can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Boo, Neil. I was not Try again, that. try again. I, I think my first answer holds. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, seriously, let me say this. On this, on this trip, um, one of the things I was looking forward to was 18 days, you know, away from legit away from some of the other responsibilities for a while and to be with Kathy. And I know her love language is quality time and uh, my love language is being making Kathy happy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, <God. laughs> no, The sincerity. Really, yeah. No, seriously. Yeah. So there have been especially a few days where we've just had a lot of good time to sometimes in the busyness of life we don't get to talk mm -hmm. together. Um, 
but in those elements, you know, if I could have a run, see some mountains, and the Georgia Bulldogs beat the Texas Longhorns, you know, 35 oh, to Oh, wow. I just did. <laughs> um, and did there's coffee. Did they didn't, oh, yeah. Last time we didn't have it. Um, and there's coffee, you know, mm -hmm. pretty, and gelato. Okay. And, 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 of course, all kind of spiritual things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because we know you. We know that's true, but that was a little <laughs> bit funny. <laughs> yeah, sorry. All right, uh, what's your perfect day? It doesn't have to, you don't have to say well, anything that I, you think I want to hear. No, huh? I, well, I appreciate that. But I, there's a part of me that likes, as you know, routine and mm -hmm. normalcy. And when things are not routine, I get kind of, you know, down or frustrated or whatever. And I look for that. But then there's that part of me that loves to do what we get to do. And that is to go on trips like this. And that's certainly out of the norm. I mean, there's nothing normal about our life in the last several years, I no. guess. And Except so, abnormality. So yeah. the, the perfect day, I guess, for me is to be able to hold your hand all day long. No, see, that was, uh, <laughs> my, the, the perfect day really is, for me, about family, and it's about learning. If I can learn something that day and study and especially something about you know, biblical history and Roman history and all that, you know. Probably involves a map or two. <laughs> what was that? A hole. Probably involves a, a map hole. or you know, two. A map or yeah. two, yeah, 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 you know. Um, you know, there's just so many things. We, who was it that was earlier talking about, was it was it Hiram on the trip about, you know, from First Peter about seeing good days and, mm -hmm. you know, and good life and that we, we can. God wants us to enjoy this life and there's so many things that, uh, to me, a, a good meal, uh, a wonderful time, you know, just enjoying God's creation, being with you. I Carla worries about that if anything ever happens to her, you know, what's going to happen to me because I'm so dependent upon her <laughs> and uh, for everything. And so, um, you know, I, I really genuinely would say that perfect day is to be with you every day. Oh, oh. Well, what I think your perfect day would involve, let's see. Um, a hole with you in it with some digging tools and you've got a book open on the other side you know that's talking about some kind of Roman history and you're excavating something out of Roman soil and maybe there is a UT game on in the background and um, well and all of your kids and grandkids kids are and grandkids, right around and they're digging right, right around yes, alongside so, you um, I, I there's just food about, involved oh but they would ice cream Jackson and I out there digging in the dirt and mm -hmm. just you know we were just <laughs> digging rocks i mean that was just absolutely the best yep. yeah 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 mm -hmm. simple stuff yeah that's the best mm -hmm. well this has been fun well i have a couple of things okay. you have to answer the same question that you posed to me is what's your favorite thing about john well it's funny because when you were saying that about neil i thought because he is genuine and um i mean it's not always what you see is what you get i think because there are always undercurrents you know that you that I know you know about Neil what mm -hmm. what's going on underneath and that they might be struggling to have the right, the best attitude because they're human mm -hmm. and I know he's human um, but but he does love people and um, always wants to do the right thing and that includes with me you know sometimes things aren't always perfect between us but I don't ever worry I mean I can I trust him wholeheartedly mm -hmm. and I know you do Neil as well so there's too many things to to choose one all right well the other thing is John I really like your shoes they're not pretty sweet oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah you know where I got them <laughs> <laughs> thanks <laughs> did you thrift those I did they were brand well, new did she tell you the story no about well well how about the shoes so <laughs> no when, when I was walking and polishing anyway. the pulpit and uh and I walk in the door and this woman says, hey, are you John Moore, right? Carla Moore's husband. I said, yeah. She goes, I just love that, the podcast that she and Kathy do together and so forth. So I go, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And I said, but so the only drawback is, is that people know a lot of things about our personal lives, you know, and stuff. She goes, yeah, I know those shoes you got. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they were these are the ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's kind so. of unsettling. <laughs> we might get a little personal, but it's 
fun. It is, and this has been fun. Thank you both for joining us and for being willing to come on our show. We knew that you would have what? Before you start the ending. <laughs> the thinker. <laughs> I do want to say, and I know y'all probably going to like most of Am the Am I going to have to get a pinch going don't here? Don't pinch me. Don't pinch I'm, me. I'm ready to pinch. No, but the, the amount of good that y'all are doing Amen. with this, the people you're reaching, and the things that you know we constantly hear about, the encouragement that you provide. I know that you don't like for me to talk about it, but uh, we, we kind of take a little pride in that, you mm -hmm. know, knowing that our lives are We're proud of you. Yeah, we are very yeah. proud of you. And um, but we know that it's not, you know, anything about what's the word I'm looking for? Like if ingratiating yourself. It's, self -aggrandizing. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's that y'all are really genuinely wanting to reach people, and you are, and just to encourage them. And so the amount of women that we encounter and seeing, you know, tell us, oh man, we love this, whatever, and when there's so much bad that's going on in the world, y'all are doing a lot of good, and truly helping people to look up. Thank you. Thank you. That was very yeah. sweet. Thank you. And um, as I was saying, <laughs> <laughs> We knew you guys would have good things to share and um, things that our listeners would enjoy and appreciate. And um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap this up unless any of you have anything else you would like to add before we close out. All right. Uh, thank you so much for listening in. And as always, if you have anything that you would like to share with us or questions or comments or suggestions, we invite you to join us at the Looking Up page on Facebook. And also be looking for things, pictures and things that we'll be sharing from this episode. And Carla, until next time. Keep looking up. Keep looking up. Love you. Love you, too. Love you guys. Love you. Love you. <laughs> Thank you. Love, love, love. Right.